thank you very much for having me here today. It's an honor and just to pre-state uh, that everything that we do at the International Women's Media Foundation comes from a feminist perspective and unfortunately the word feminism uh, is somewhat taboo in the United States, probably more than Europe. So we actually don't say the word feminist very often. Uh, it's kind of refreshing to be here and to hear that perspective spoken proudly and loudly. Safety is one of the pillars of the IWMF's work. We have four of them, safety, equity, opportunity, and recognition. It's in the organization's DNA. And safety in particular is a prerequisite to women's participation in the news media. We have had a saying for 30 years that there can be no press freedom without the equal voice of women. And now we say, or we add, and women cannot participate in the news media without safety. I'd like to start with a sad situation that came to light yesterday that we posted about, despite the fact that we had known about this since August, but it's the dis disappearance of a Ukrainian journalist named Victoria Roshina. She is our Courage in Journalism Award winner from last year. She was captured twice in Ukraine before this third time. In August, she disappeared. Uh, she went to report. It's thought that she tried to get into the occupied territories, but she didn't tell people where she went. Uh, it's conjectured that she didn't tell people where she went because people would try to stop her and she didn't want to be stopped. She was reporting on many issues in Ukraine, including the disappearance of Ukrainian children in Russia, and she has not been heard from since. And out of deep desperation of her friends and colleagues and family, they decided to go public with that information just yesterday. So we posted uh, on the internet uh, the Daily Beast posted an article, and it's been picked up broadly. You might have read about it. But I want to just quote one of her friends and colleagues said, Alisa, I think it's time to raise hell and publish. At least if she's in a basement, they'll stop torturing her. And I say this just to kind of set the tone of this is emblematic of why we're here today. This is the worst case scenario, right? This is somebody reporting an armed conflict that has been captured and it's almost the situation that we're all most used to handling because that is where safety and precautions and safety training for journalists started. It started with war correspondents. Primarily, I would say foreign correspondents that were going into conflicts and their news organizations perhaps had the foresight and the resources to offer them safety training, whereas local journalists like Victoria normally do not have that luxury and are left on their own. There's been an evolution in uh, safety training and in the recognition of what safety means, but I bring you back to Victoria's case and to the posting and to the fact that her story has been picked up by newspapers all over the world to say that although uh, I think it's starting to be perceived as somewhat quaint, advocacy is still critically important. And regardless of all of the other work that we do that is critically important too, it is hugely important to take on and continue the traditional advocacy campaigns that we do on behalf of journalists. Most of the time they work, uh, they do influence what happens on the ground, and that is why they decided to go public. So I encourage everybody not to forget that the simple notion, it's perceived as simple now, but it takes a lot of coordination, is truly important, and I thank all the organizations who continue to do that around the world. So the evolution of safety and the evolution of what organizations like ours perceive as the need for safety certainly has evolved over the years, but includes cases like the primary case covering armed conflict and hostile environments. But obviously our definition of hostile environments has hugely expanded over the years. When you're talking about local journalists, you're also talking about attacks from non-governmental entities, from cartels, from corrupt organizations or groups that have an interest in silencing journalists. We also, unfortunately, increasingly, at least in the United States, are facing journalism and journalists being attacked by bystanders, by the public, 
by individuals at political rallies and at social justice demonstrations who now believe that journalism is the enemy, and we all, I think, know why that is the case. That perception has been spread throughout the world, thanks to our former president. Uh, It existed before, but now it's vocalized and acted upon by citizens on the street, which is really quite shocking. To add to those attacks by the general public, which obviously has been contributed to by the lack of trust over the years in the news media, is attacks from governments themselves and governmental systems, and in that I include the police on the ground at these demonstrations, but also legal attacks that are much more pervasive, slap suits that we've all heard about, that use the government to criminalize and to punish journalists and to basically make it impossible for them to do their work by keeping them occupied and wrapped up in criminal cases and in trials year after year. I was in Manila a few weeks ago at Rappler, and Maria Ressa told me that she spends almost 80% of her time fighting the lawsuits and the cases that have been brought against her. And that is absolutely by design. And then, of course, almost as an afterthought, is the safety incidents that occur as a result of natural disasters and climate-based incidents. And we can't forget to include training journalists how to deal with these climate disasters as they're increasingly facing them. So the perceived threat has changed, and so has our attitudes, thank goodness. And I I am an optimist, and so I think it's critically important that this perception also includes the recognition that journalists are not just attacked because of their work, they're attacked because of their identity. And in identity, I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about race, ethnicity, et cetera. LGBTQI journalists, journalists from marginalized communities, we know, and it's been documented, that they are harassed more than others. This includes sexual harassment and assault, and of course, we always have to think about that when they're thinking about safety and safety issues. And unfortunately, not only sometimes, but often, these attacks happen in newsrooms. It's also important not to forget, and I have an asterisk next to this, and and it's indicative because I think uh, often freelancers are an asterisk in a lot of news organizations' minds. And so while media development organizations do put freelancers at the top of their agenda, I think we have a long way to go within news organizations to recognize the duty of care that comes from hiring a freelancer, as well as the duty of care that comes from having your staff. And then, of course, we have journalists in exile. How do you support journalists who have been forced to flee their countries? How do you support their reporting? And increasingly, how do you support the fact that even once they have left their country, they're still not safe? They are still being attacked outside of their countries, and the families that they have left behind are continuing to be attacked. And that is a tremendous challenge for us in our line of work. And then, of course, we come to online violence and online harassment. I like to call it violence because I think that the word violence is more descriptive of what happens to a journalist at the receiving end of an online attack. More than 70% of women journalists have experienced online violence. That means that every time they open their computer in the safety of their own homes, they are being horribly attacked. And some of those, of course, there's a, a, a progression of those attacks. And depending on who is engaging and who is the perpetrator of the attack, it depends on the volume. But I can tell you that most of the journalists that the IWMF talks to are facing this kind of attack and harassment on a daily basis. And not only on a daily basis, but the kinds and the, the vitriol that they are seeing There has been evidence and research that shows that these journalists are experiencing symptoms that are similar to PTSD. That's why I call it violence. I think that we've 
finally come around to the knowledge and the acceptance that just because it happens virtually, you can just ignore it, sweep it under the carpet, it's not hurting anybody. It is causing real harm. And it's not only causing harm to the journalists who are experiencing it, it's causing harm to journalism. Most journalists who experience this kind of attack are engaging in self-censorship. They're not only watching every word that they say in order not to set off the trolls, they are also deciding not to cover certain issues. And we're seeing this a lot in the United States in the coverage of far-right movements, of, um, of the elections, um, and sadly, as we're here today, one of the most dangerous beats, at least when it comes to online violence, is any issue addressing feminist and women's rights. And I think that we can point right to the uh, unleashing of the misogynistic culture that has been surfaced. I, I think it's always been there, but it is now alive and well, and especially on the internet. S tragically and frighteningly, 20% of attacks of abuse online result in physical violence. As I said before, I think it's important to approach online violence as something that's as serious as physical violence, and you cannot separate the two. But this statistic shows us that you really cannot separate the two. 20% of those abuses seed physical violence. What does that mean for the journalist who's sitting at their kitchen table and seeing this kind of attack. Of course, there are ways, and we'll talk about digital security along the way, how, of finding out where this person is, is this person real, are they close to me, are they far from me? But that doesn't get at the real danger of the uh, propulsion for violence to anybody who is viewing that post and who is seeing it. It is literally impossible for a journalist who's being attacked online to know whether or not this is gonna result in something physical, something outside of their front door. And that is the real fear and the real pressure that journalists are facing. Which leads me to the psychological and psychosocial impact of living with this kind of trauma day in and day out. As of September of 2023, the IWMF approved more than $300,000 for psychological security of journalists. We have an emergency fund, and 60% of the cases that we receive requests for are for psychosocial support. I think that's really changed over time. In some ways, it's nice to see the statistics because it means that people are actually seeking help, but it also is extremely troubling that that is what they're experiencing. And 42% of that 60% are seeking psychosocial support because of the online attacks that they're receiving. I think that's also really important to, to think about. For many of our organizations, the first line of defense is this emergency support. We, those of us who are lucky enough to have funds and you know those funds dwindle and go very quickly, are responding in real time to the needs of journalists on the ground. 23% of the journalists who come to the IWMF experience direct threats, and 37% of those are seeking relocation. I think one of the hardest experience of my career was the exodus from Afghanistan and the flood of requests for emergency support that came out of that crisis. And we still receive emergency support requests. There are still hundreds of journalists stuck in third countries, journalists stuck in Afghanistan who can't get out. I don't want to call our response to that crisis a failure because I think it hopefully is a once in a lifetime situation, but we were not prepared. And uh, my colleagues and I have been through a lot, but we still look at each other and discuss how that incident, that situation really nearly broke us. Um, sorry. This leads me to point out the question of visas. We have discussions with the US government all the time about the need to, to fast track visas for journalists. That has not happened in America. I don't know what the situation is in Europe, but I think that's an issue that we all have to advocate for. 
Even something as simple as inviting journalists to participate in an award ceremony in Washington, D.C. to receive one of the highest honors of journalism, it's nearly impossible to get them a visa to enter the country, much less a journalist who is in trouble and needs a visa immediately. So I think that the visa situation is really critical. It's also really critical for us to change the culture in newsrooms. I know that this shift is happening in Europe, it's happening in the US, but it's not happening fast enough, and there certainly aren't enough resources, or at least that's what we hear from newsrooms. There aren't enough resources for us to make safety a priority. There aren't enough resources for us to make psychosocial security a priority. We can't help our journalists on digital security because we don't have a digital security expert. I don't want to curse up here, but I call BS on that line of thinking. If you can't keep your journalists safe, you should not be in the business of journalism. Thank you. That being said, the IWMF is doing all it can to support news organizations around the world and around the US, and they are struggling. This is in the US at least, what seems to be an industry in severe danger. And that mere fact is also putting dangerous in, uh, journalists in danger. So we are working directly with newsrooms. We have stored, started several cohorts of journalists uh, where we're uh, trying to help them, uh, newsrooms develop policies to create sustained change. What we have found over the years is that you can work with the best leader in a newsroom, you can train them, but the second they leave, all of their initiatives go out the door with them. So it's really critical to focus on policy making, on culture shift, and for that you do need a champion within the newsroom, you do need resources, you do need them to devote the time to take on those um, those priorities, which is not easy when they're trying to meet their business needs, they're trying to cover the 24-7 news cycle, et cetera. I do see a culture shift within newsrooms when it comes to safety, but I think that still the resources remain a big issue, and I think it's important to um, try to support them, even though sometimes we feel like they're woefully inadequate. So that leads us to you know, the fundamental question, why are these attacks increasing? I think what we have seen and I think what we all feel viscerally is that the situation is getting worse for journalists around the world. And I do think that we can point to those uh, authoritarian tendencies that are putting a, a target on the backs of journalists around the world and we've seen it directed mostly at women journalists. I think we can point to very specific cases with Duterte in uh, the Philippines attacking Maria Reza, with Bolsonaro in Brazil attacking Patricia Campos Melo, with Modi in India attacking Rana Ayub, with AMLO in Mexico attacking Carmen Aristegui, and I'm just naming you know, four of those incidents. Those four incidents have led to the severe and massive attacks of these journalists online. And these are concerted efforts that are started, I would say again, seeded by a mere comment in front of a microphone with the full knowledge of what is to come. And these leaders aren't the only ones that engage in this. Of course, we have media personalities, opinion uh, politicians who seed these kinds of attacks. If there's one thing that I really want to hit home for, you know, you all know this well, but for the general public, is that these aren't mob attacks. This isn't just some random situation. Where it's the internet. The internet is awful. It is not, the, the internet is awful, but this is not the internet. This is leaders capturing and using the internet, using state control, using state money to see these attacks that seem random but are not. They are fully and wholeheartedly orchestrated. Another example I'll give just of the brazenness of this kind of attack is when Modi at a White House press conference singled out an American reporter, Sabrina Siddiqui from the Wall Street Journal, and singled her out and criticized her. 
And immediately anybody in our industry who was hearing that press conference knew that trouble was coming and so did she. She came to the IWMF right after that and we helped to protect her. And here's another thing that I would say that is important for us to keep in mind. I, I keep going back to these like really tried and true and simple facts of our work, which is that most of all, she felt supported. And let's not discount how important it is for journalists to just feel like you have their back, that you understand what they're going through, and that you're there to support them. That is one of the things that we hear over and over again. I didn't feel like my media organization was supporting me. I feel like you had my back. And that is hugely, hugely important. So how do we respond? How do we fill these gaps that are left by the news industry uh, that is dying? by uh, industry where the journalists are being attacked more and more. Um, a saying that we like to repeat over and over again is that you can't save journalism if you don't save journalists. One of the messages that I would like to send, and I do as often as I can to funders, is that stop throwing good money after bad. Media organizations are, are going under for a reason, and I would contend that a lot of that reason is that they are not representative of the communities that they're trying to serve. So let's look at the makeup of these media organizations before you fund them, and let's not make journalists the afterthought in your funding priorities. Thank you. Some of the resources that the IWMF has put together include a guide to protecting newsroom and journalists against online violence, a mental health guide for journalists facing online violence. We are working with the DART Center to try to train more psychotherapists to work with journalists. We all know that this is a specialized field and that we need more, more practitioners to support journalists. And we, more, we need more diverse practitioners. We need more diverse practitioners for psychosocial support, and we need more diverse practitioners for safety training. The IWMF also started a program called the Next Gen Safety Trainers, where we're training a group of journalists of color to provide safety training in the US. I think it's imperative to recognize that you need to see and hear from people who have shared lived experience with you to be able to understand what is going on when you're out on the street reporting. For example, several years ago, because I do think the situation has changed, a black journalist in the United States told me that her safety trainer told her that when she's being uh, threatened, that she should go to the police. And she looked at me and said, Elisa, there is no way I'm going to the police when I'm being threatened. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna go find somebody I trust, but she did not trust the police. And there was that fundamental lack of synergy between her safety training and her lived experience that told her, no, the police is not where I go when I'm seeking safety. I think it's important for us when we go to these news organizations to get buy-in from the top. I'm sure that you all are well aware. Um, you really need an advocate at the top to push through these changes and to support their journalists. I think for a long time, many of us were training individual journalists, and that, of course, is absolutely valuable. But a journalist is not going to change the culture in their media organization, and a journalist is not going to be able to advocate or to change policies in their media organization. So working with the top is critical important. I have a note here to myself to talk about platforms. I hate talking about platforms because that is when I'm at my most pessimistic. I have no faith that the platforms are ever going to do anything to help journalists. We've seen it in real time. Everybody is complaining about how X has let go its security team, how awful it is, how could X do this. And you know what I say? I look back at the past 15 years or 10 years of Twitter, Twitter did not help journalists. Twitter has always been horrible to journalists. So let's not recreate the past and believe and, and delusionize ourselves into thinking that Twitter was great before Elon Musk took over. Nobody hates Twitter more than I do, but this is not new. It's always been a cesspool, and it's always been particularly horrible for women journalists. They're doing less than they did before, 
But in my experience, what they did before is go to conferences, give out a card and say, call me if something happens to you. That is not really a solution. Facebook, I have the same feelings about Facebook. They are not going to do anything voluntarily to support journalists or to support women journalists, other platforms, YouTube, every, every other platform. They are not in this for social good, they're in this to make money. And I think that it's really going to take governments, and I applaud European governments for trying to put a stop to this. I have no hope that that is gonna happen in the US at all. So we'll see where that goes. We had an unfortunate incident recently in the US. There was a US Supreme Court decision <clears throat> that came down just a couple of weeks ago that went largely unnoticed by the media development community, which kind of surprised me because it basically is codifying the need for the, for the receiver of online violence to prove that the person that is delivering that violence meant to cause them harm. So how do you prove that somebody understood that what they were doing to you was deliberately meant to cause you harm when they're saying, oh, those 5,000 messages I sent last week telling the journalists that I knew where they lived, that, did I scare them? I didn't mean to scare them. So this is really, this is going to cause a lot of pain for a lot of journalists in the United States. One of the biggest disappointments is that nowhere in the decision or in the rebuttal to this decision was the impact of online violence against journalists or women ever mentioned. So I think we see that divide. The ivory tower does not understand what is happening on the ground. And that is an unfortunate situation that has now been codified into US law. So what, one of, I don't want to leave completely depressed. And uh, we're all here for solutions. So just a couple of solutions and things that are, are working today. Um, the IWMF has formed the Coalition Against Online Violence. There are now 75 organizations that are part of this group. And I think it's important, you mentioned earlier, the need to collaborate and to have partnerships. And we know that funders love partnerships, but they love them because they work. It's really important, but one of the things that we have discovered out of this coalition, and we all know, working in small nonprofit organizations, collaboration is hard. It takes a lot of time, and sometimes it's just easier to do it by yourself. We have put in place a governing system for this coalition that shares the leadership. There is no organization that owns this coalition. It is shared. The decision-making is shared, and I think it's really important to look at governing practices of these coalitions. Another group I want to single out, and I know Elizabeth Cantonese is going to speak later, is the Culture of Safety Alliance, also a collaborative of media development and news organizations that work together to support journalists' safety, especially those are freelancers. So I'm going to wrap it up, and I'm going to say that I've had a bit of an epiphany in the last couple of weeks. I went to a training course in Palo Alto uh, that was about amplifying impact. And one of the things that shifted in my thinking was that we all really want to put ourselves out of business, right? We don't really want to do this work. We don't want this work to be necessary. And there aren't enough of us. So I am vowing that the IWMF is going to dedicate our safety work, at least a big part of it, to really creating safety trainers around the world, to helping journalists on the ground to spread this knowledge holistically and locally. And the more that we can do to empower local journalists and local media development organizations, our impact is going to exponentially increase and it's going to help journalists to stay safe. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness.